stop. Meanwhile, this battle for position up front continues. SVG trying to hang on to the second spot, and he does somehow. <sighs> Where do I even start with this one? I mean, we had a completely normal race. A clean race. Not a lot of incidents. Maybe a couple of spins here or there, but nothing crazy. And then all of a sudden, Matt Benedetto's car dies with six laps to go, and it turns into an absolute crap fest. We've got re restart wrecks, oil being laid all across the racetrack. It took over an hour for the last six laps of the race to be completed. I mean, what are we doing, honestly? Um, Watkins Glen was chaotic. But first, I want to talk about the winner. Connor Zilich, 18 years old, 18 years old, made his first Xfinity Series start and led, let's see here, like 46 laps and won in his Xfinity Series debut at 18 years old. I have an extremely hot take about him. I don't think the internet's ready for this hot take. I think he's pretty good at driving cars. I know, really hot. I can hear the boos from across the street. Yeah. Okay, but yes, obviously, Connor Zilich is very, very talented. There's a reason he's going straight to the Xfinity Series at 19. I guess he'll still be 18 for a bit, but 18, 19 years old next year. He is an extremely, extremely talented driver. There's a reason he's been on Trackhouse's driver lineup, their contract sheet, for quite a while now. He's won some endurance racing, the 24 Hours of Daytona, I think. He's won a bunch of ARCA races. He's won a pole in the truck series. He won the pole today. He won the race today. He's going to do things in NASCAR. And if he eventually goes elsewhere, he's going to do things elsewhere. The guy is extremely talented at driving cars, as I said. But where, once again, we started with the winner, Connor Zilich. Extremely talented guy. Dominated today. But who didn't dominate today was a little bit surprising. Shane Van Gisbergen has really just obliterated the field this year in the road courses, even when there's alternate strategies, even when there's, you know, a couple minor setbacks when he goes off course in Portland, he's able to rally back and win. He's able to dominate Chicago in the Xfinity Series. But yes, he had a loss earlier in the year at Coda, but he led the most laps in that race and he was leading with three to go before a caution came out and Ultimately, a NASCAR overtime restart. He got bumped out of the way by Austin Hill, and he tried to fight back, but Kyle Larson was there with fresher tires to sneak through and win. But uh, today was honestly his worst road course race of the year in the Xfinity Series. He led 14 laps, yes, but it was due to alternate strategy, and don't get me wrong, you know, you have to get there. He had a pit road penalty. Uh, he qualified 14th, and... He wasn't making passes as easily as we've seen him do in the past. Whether it was a car issue or just the track, I don't know. But let's go through his day real quick. First, let's talk about Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen, if you're a longtime Supercars fan, if you keep up with all the drivers who have gone elsewhere, you know who Marco Sambros is. Well, Marco Sambros made a name for himself in NASCAR at Watkins Glen. Won two Cup Series races at Watkins Glen, including one of the most iconic finishes in NASCAR history in 2012 when he had to pass Kyle Busch. Well, Kyle Busch got dumped, but then he had to pass Brad Keselowski on the last lap of that race. Slipping, sliding, some bumpers being used. A thrilling, all-time great finish. He also, as I said, won in 2011. He won an Xfinity race there. And, of course, he went on to compete for other wins, but ultimately fell short in, I think it was 2014, to A.J. Allmendinger. Now, Watkins Glen is in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. Very, very pretty part of the country, I might add. Very pretty. Uh, lots of elevation changes on this road course. It's a 2.45-mile road course, which is equivalent to... 3.94 kilometers. It's confusing on the turn count because like the inner loop, the chicane, the bus stop is like 4A and 4B and 4C or something like that. So technically it's like a seven turn track, but if you want to go anyways, it's at least seven turns. 
There is an additional section to the track that Formula One used to use that sports car endurance racing uses called the boot. NASCAR does not use that. NASCAR just takes the outer loop and goes straight. It's one of NASCAR's oldest road courses. It's one of the original road courses. Uh, when I was growing up, it was always Watkins Glen and Sonoma. Watkins Glen was always the more fun race, I thought. And now it's one of the six or seven road courses, however many races we go to in the Cup Series. But as I said, it's a two and a half mile track about. It's got a lot of history with Formula One being there with some endurance racing there. NASCAR's been there a while but there's there's a lot of elevation change. There's a lot of different turns, but it's an extremely fast-paced racetrack. A lot of speed at this place, and it's what it's known for. As I said, it's in the Finger Lakes region. It's near Ithaca, New York. If you want some specifics on New York, obviously New York. Known for New York City, this is nowhere close to New York City. It's over 250 miles, which uh, I didn't look up this number. Give me a second which is over 400 kilometers away from New York City. Of course, New York City, the Big Apple. You got the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty. You got Times Square. You've got the stock market, all that stuff. That's New York City, of course. Everyone knows New York for New York City. The Knicks, the Yankees, and of course, there's also the Mets, the Nets, and uh, the Giants. Oh, man, they suck. Anyways, side note. Back to racing. That was the side note. Watkins Glen. I was curious to see how Shane Van Gisbergen would do at this track just due to Marcos Ambrose and his history at this specific racetrack. Now, obviously, Shane Van Gisbergen and Marcos Ambrose, two different drivers, but they come from the same discipline and they came over to NASCAR later in their careers. I figured, well, how's he going to do? Is he going to be as successful? Is he going to be... Because when you looked at Marcos Ambrose at Watkins Glen, he was winning or competing for wins, and he wasn't exactly in top-tier equipment. He was at Richard Petty Motorsports, who at the time was not a great race team. But how would Shane Van Gisbergen do? I know colleague has been down a bit, and this is also the Xfinity Series and not the Cup Series. colleague has been a little bit down this year, but on the road courses, SVG has still excelled. He's won three races this year. I thought he was going to dominate this race, but it was quite the opposite. As I said, started this race 13th. Well, he qualified 13th, I should specify. They made some adjustments to the cars. There were some issues with the brakes. And when you make certain adjustments on the car between qualifying and the race, they are unapproved by NASCAR, and therefore you have to start at the back of the field. There were five cars that had to drop to the rear due to unapproved adjustments. So Shane Van Gisbergen unofficially started 33rd, 34th, maybe 35th, out of 38 cars. So of course, coming from the back to the front, regardless of how good you are or how good your car is, it's going to be a struggle. A lot can happen, especially in NASCAR. Well, as I said, the majority of this race was pretty normal. And Watkins Glen is a strategy track. And especially with the stages, how you can kind of break up the stages, which we'll get into in a minute. Shane Van Gisbergen had to make his way up through the field before they could start, you know, strategizing for a potential race win. And he was able to make his way into the top 20 in, I think it was eight laps. And then by lap 15, he was able to get up to the top 15. But by that point, he wasn't going to pass any more cars because there was a huge gap from, I think it was 14th to 15th or 13th to 14th. So he's just sitting there in 14th or 15th, kind of minding his business. And stage one ended at lap 20. Well, the rule in NASCAR is, is that you cannot pit with under two laps to go in a stage. And because of that, you'll see a lot of guys at these road courses because at the road courses, if you're a front runner, you can pit do a full pit stop, four tires, fuel, make your adjustments, and come back onto the track and stay on the lead lap. And then when everyone else who stayed out, they pit under caution and you suddenly get the lead back. You give up the stage points, but you get your track position back. So you kind of are exchanging one thing for the other, stage points or track position. So Shane Van Gisbergen, despite being 14th, he opted to pit and take the track position at the beginning of stage two. So no stage points for Shane Van Gisbergen. I think he finished 36th, but it got a little scary there for him. 
He came out right in front of the leader, Connor Zilich, who, as I said, dominated this race, was the fastest guy all day. And Connor Zilich, despite having older tires, was right on Shane's rear bumper the entire last lap and a half of the stage and almost put him a lap down, which would have essentially ruined Shane's day. But SVG was able to stay out. He was able to hold on and finish it in 36th on the lead lap. Now, he was one of about eight or nine guys who pitted under the green flag, and he was able to restart in the top 10. A lot of track position made up. And he was able to make himself up a couple of positions there in the stage, and we saw him get up to, I think it was as high as sixth. The top five, A.J. Allmendinger, really good road course racer. Even he was struggling with his car this weekend, just not a lot of pace in it. And he was holding up the top five. He was leading laps, and he was doing a good job of playing defense, but he was holding up the top five and Shane Van Gisbergen and eventually got to the tail end of that. But by the time he had gotten to the tail end of that, the cars with tires had caught up to him. And so he lost a couple spots, but the same story as stage one. Pits with about three to go in the stage to make sure they don't get penalized for pitting too late. And he ends up starting, restarting stage three about 13th or 14th, I believe. Now, he was able to make him make his way into the top 10 pretty quickly due to those other guys staying out, having older tires. Some guys opted not to pit at the end of the stage and also not to pit at the caution at the end of the stage because of where the caution fell. It was lap 40 of 82. The pit cycle around here for fuel is between, I think it's like 28 and 32 laps. So you couldn't make it to the end on fuel. Might as well push it. But those guys with fresher tires, they were going to be able to make up a little bit of track position. So as I said, Shane Van Gisbergen able to make his way up a little bit into the top 10. There was a quick caution and then there was another restart. And I think he got up to 6th or 7th. And this is where the strategy gets funky again. We had some guys pit early in the stage, pit during that caution. And then something really weird happened. I have never seen this before. Or if I have, I haven't thought of it. If you shortcut the chicane on the back stretch, the bus stop chicane, you get a penalty. But normally it's a self-inflicted penalty because you have to stop in the paved area you have to come to a complete stop and then you can go again. And that's kind of your penalty for missing the chicane because if you just blow through it, don't stop, you have to come down pit road and serve a pass through. So under caution, the same rules apply. And for some reason, Ty Gibbs, Sam Mayer, and Connor Zilich, who are running one, two, three, blow through the chicane. Why? I don't know. They claim they thought the rules were different under caution. I don't know why they did. Sam Mayer and Ty Gibbs have raced at this place multiple times. I don't know why they thought that was a rule. Connor Zilich, it's his first ever start here. He followed the leader, so maybe that was his excuse, and that's a valid excuse, and he bounced back. But Ty Gibbs and Sam Mayer, really confused about that move, guys. Anyways, uh, that promoted Shane Van Gisbergen from 6th to 3rd, and... Uh, Top two guys ran away, and then Shane passed, I think it was William Byron, for second. And then the leader pitted, and this is how Shane Van Gisbergen led his laps. He stayed out an extra 10 to 15 laps, just waiting on a caution maybe, trying to have a tire advantage for those last 15 laps, and he pits with 15 laps to go. And unfortunately, Shane Van Gisbergen received a penalty for speeding on pit road, pretty black and white rule. Uh, if the pit road speed limit is 45 miles an hour, you're allowed five miles over. So if you're going 50.0001, that's a speeding penalty. I don't know how much he was over, but he was over. And as I said, it's a black and white rule. Speeding on pit road, it's a pass-through penalty. So suddenly Shane Van Gisbergen, who came out in 12th before the penalty, had to pit again. And he didn't stop for fuel or tires. He just had to do a pass-through to pit road comes back out in the 23rd or 24th position. And at that point, it's like, okay, day's over. Terrible result. Worst race of the season on a road course. But then there's a caution. Matt DiBenedetto's car decides to die with about six laps to go. And that changed everything. Well, at this point, Shane Van Gisbergen had made his way up to 19th, which, once again, uh, 19th. Not much you can do with 19th. 
Well, under this caution, they got the car off the track and five cars in front of Shane Van Gisbergen decided to pit. They said, let's do it. Let's put some fresh tires on this thing. Or they thought, oh, we're going to run out of fuel. A lot of these top contenders were very close on fuel. In fact, I think a couple of them ran out late, including Ty Gibbs. And Shane Van Gisbergen's restarting 14th. But at that point, it's like, you're going to need some freaky things to happen in order to have a shot at this win. And oh boy, did freaky things happen during these last two restarts. Restart number one. Yeah, no. They just start killing each other, wrecking each other, and they just forgot they were talented. Everyone's wrecking Austin Hill and Anthony Alfredo are leaking fluid all over the racetrack. Austin Hill smartly just, he knows his car is dead, stops on the spot. Anthony Alfredo goes halfway around the racetrack leaking fluid and... Uh, we had a lengthy red flag. It was at least 30 minutes. It was terrible. It was torturous. And uh, yeah, so Shane Van Gisbergen made up five or six spots. Like he was up to ninth or eighth. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like he's got enough fuel to make it to the end. He's got slightly fresher tires. We're one caution away from like him having a shot at this thing. Well, if you're a Shane Van Gisbergen fan, your wish has been granted. There was another caution. They started wrecking again idiots <laughs> more fluid was being leaked so we're running more laps under caution and shane van gisbergen at this point he restarted seventh the restart before he's up to fourth he's on row two and it's like oh my goodness he's gonna win this thing isn't he he's gonna have his worst road course race of the season he's gonna run poorly all day for his standards and he's gonna as kyle bush would say back into this win because everyone's gonna round out of fuel well not everyone ran out of fuel. Connor Zilich runs away with this thing. Shane Van Gisbergen, AJ Allmendinger, Chandler Smith, Sheldon Creed, and a few other guys had one of the most intense battles of the season until half a lap to go when Ryan Sieg and Riley Herbst made contact on the backstretch, a high-speed area of the track, and they were really racing in a pack, kind of like Talladega. And everyone starts wrecking. Race is over. Yeah, fifth place. I, I, fifth or sixth, I can't remember. They switched the results. Fifth place. So another top five for Shane Van Gisbergen. But the big issue for him is, is that they had an off weekend. I know they finished fifth. And, you know, you look at his rookie season, you can only look at four or five top fives on the year. And a top five is great points wise. But the problem is there's only one more race in the regular season. You're not going to get top 10 in the points you really needed to bank those playoff points today. Even if you didn't need to, even if you didn't win the race, win a stage because every single point matters. I'm going to talk about the playoffs next week. Bristol is the regular season finale, which by the way is going to be on Friday night. It's not going to be a Saturday race. It's going to be on Friday night here in the United States. And that's the playoff cutoff line. That if you are not within the top 12 or you haven't won a race, you are out of the playoffs. And then we start the playoffs at Kansas in two weeks. I will do a full playoff breakdown. I'll break down the bracket. I'll explain the rules to you. I'll give you Shane Van Gisbergen's best chance to advance through each round. But the point being, these playoff points are so crucial. And when we don't have a clear favorite this year, you need every point you can. Especially when you look at that first round, you have Talladega and the Roval, which I think plays really well to Shane Van Gisbergen. But that second round, Vegas, Homestead, Martinsville. Brand new track in Homestead. Vegas, a track with limited laps in Martinsville, which is going to be chaotic. Shane Van Gisbergen, he, he needs all the points he can possibly get in these playoffs. And that's where I think the disappointment lies, if you were to ask me. Now, Shane Van Gisbergen, it's a great result for him. I'm sure he had fun, great racing at the end of that race between him and his teammate. I saw people online crying about it, and I was like, guys, SVG and AJ Allmendinger, are, they think they're racing for the win right there. They think Connor Zilich is going to run out of fuel, and it's going to be a battle between them two. Why would they give an inch? Why would AJ Allmendinger let Shane Van Gisbergen go, knowing he could have a shot at his first win of the season? Why would SVG... Let Almendinger go knowing, oh, I could get more playoff points here. I could get another trophy here. It makes no sense why people were complaining. But Shane Van Gisbergen, as I said, wild day, roller coaster of a day. Started at the back, made his way to the front, went back again, came to the front again. 
Oh, it gives me a headache, borderline. Um, Tomorrow's the cup race. Shane Van Gisbergen is racing in that one. He's starting third in that race tomorrow. Should be a fun one. We've got some heavy hitters deep in the field. Kyle Larson, Tyler Reddick, Chase Elliott, just to name a few in the mid-pack. I think tomorrow's going to be a thrilling race. Xfinity race today was decent until it became a wreck fest at the end, which just really annoys me when we have a decent race and all these guys start wrecking each other. The racing between SVG, Almendinger, Chandler Smith, Sheldon Creed, all those guys was great. I'm pretty sure there was still oil on the track, and that's why they were sliding and banging into each other, but I don't know. But uh, fun race today until the Crash Fest. Cup Series race tomorrow. F1 race tomorrow should be a fun one. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. We do this every week. Uh, but next week is the playoff cutoff line. Once that race is over, I'll give you more details on when I will do my playoff previews and my Xfinity picks and all that stuff. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you guys in the next one.